This week, community, creation, collaboration. On the Laura Flanders Show, we talk with Pamela Schiffman and Iris Bowen about remaking a former women's prison in New York into a space for women's liberation and activism. And we hear from photographer and author Yoav Litvin, who specializes in the art of collaboration. It's all coming up right here on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. People, power, and placemaking. There is not an organizer we interview on this program who doesn't talk about the crisis of real estate. Groups need places to work and meet and come together, especially in an era like ours of isolation and virtual connections. But what does community building look like in a time of privatization and shrinking common space? What models exist for viable, self-sustainable community property? places. My guests today are giving all of this a lot of thought. They're two of the people behind the Women's Building Project in New York City. It is remaking and reimagining a former women's prison and turning it into a new women's community for transformation and justice and impact. The project so far has involved a collective and complex process. Here to talk about that and what has been learned is Pamela Schiffman, Executive Director of the Novo Foundation, and Iris Bowen, Program Coordinator for the Coming Home Program at the Mount Sinai St. Luke's Institute for Advanced Medicine. Welcome both. We should say at the start that the Novo Foundation and Pamela are big supporters of this program, so you're not going to get brutal attacking questions. <laughs> um, I'll just be upfront about that. <laughs> This process, though, I thought was important enough that we should bring it to our audience because it's complicated. Creating space, creating space in space that is so loaded, in a time that's so fraught. Um, why, why a building of all your possible priorities, Pamela? Well, a women's building has been wanted, desired, worked for, hoped for in New York City for decades. Since I joined Novo 10 years ago, I asked activists from all over the world what they most needed to be most impactful in their work advocating for girls and women's rights. And what I kept hearing over and over again was the importance of space, the importance of being able to connect with peer organizations, to learn from each other, to organize together. And so when we had the opportunity to support the development of a building to do just that, and it was a former women's prison, to be able to turn a place of pain and confinement into a place of justice and healing and liberation and possibility, we knew we absolutely had to make that happen. Has New York ever had a women's building? Hmm. There have been attempts to have a women's building. In the early 1970s, a group of women occupied a space in the East Village um, to create a women's building. So there have been kind of starts and stops. There's a really fantastic women's building in San Francisco, and the executive director of that building is very actively involved in the women's building in New York City. We're building a huge community of women who are helping make this possible. So Iris, tell us a little bit about this building. It's on West 20th Street, which now is Chelsea, right over on the West Side Highway. If you've ever been in a traffic jam right there, um, you might have passed it. What's been its history? What is that building to you? Well, it was home for me for at least four years. And so when you say Chelsea, I used to look out the window and say, boy, I wish I was out there, you know. But um, it was home for me up and down the stairs for four years. And um, so now that it's turning into something more meaningful and more powerful, I'm very excited. Now, the building was having problems before um, the decision to close it. And am I right in thinking the decision to close it that was made by the state was because of Hurricane Sandy? Was that it? Yes, that what is happened? correct. Uh, hur when Hurricane Sandy came, um, the water flooded the building and um, they decided to close it. They shipped the women out to another facility and um, they then closed it. So what complications present themselves as you think of taking over this building? One thing that's really important in taking over the building is making sure that we maintain the history of what happened in that place mm -hmm. and that we use this as an opportunity to educate people about the ongoing incarceration of women and the fact that this is absolutely 
a nightmare for women in this country and that we are locking up the most marginalized women in our country um, at rates that are, you know, the fastest growing prison population in this country are of women. Mm -hmm. So we are, we need to make sure that we, you know, maintain the history and also create a space that imagines something new and that is actually going to be a building that serves the you know, movements for social justice now and 99 years from now. Mm. So we really need to put a lot of thought into this and a lot of creativity. And so we have been building a huge community of people. You know, Iris has been on the advisory circle for the women's building along with many other incarcerated women, formerly incarcerated women who are activists, as well as activists from across the world who are working to advance justice for girls and women everywhere and really thinking about how we can create a space that's flexible and that is going to really allow us to do the best work possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, well, you tell me. When I heard that the prison was being closed, I was both happy and also conscious that this is a big hit for the families that wanted to, that need to visit mm -hmm. their incarcerated members. Yes, absolutely. What happens to them? So um, they have to travel perhaps on the Metro North or take a bus. So it's a, a, it's a longer commute to get to see the family and probably um, the desire was to get to Bayview to be closer to your family. So they, they were shipped out to different places. And so, you know, a little hardship on the family to get to a visit. So it's not just good news when a Right, it's good news closes. for some and, you know, good news for I mean, bad news for others, so, yeah, it was good news. Uh, basically, we were happy that it closed, but for those that were, you know, that are inside, it, and they had to move, pack up everything, and move, it's like moving your whole life somewhere else, so. Tell us yeah. about who you think of, who you knew there. Is there someone who you carry in your heart as you do this work? Yeah, there's a lot of women. Um, I went back to visit, and uh, when you go in to visit, you can't speak to the women. So I saw a lot of women and I was like, oh my God. And so when I left that day, I was heartbroken because you know some of the women are there doing 50 years. They were young when they came in. Uh, I mean, these know, are people that ripped years. off banks and the whole American po population <laughs> through mortgage No, kind of no. Um, some of them, um, to be honest, a lot of the women there have um, domestic violence issues. I would say more than half the population has issues with domestic violence or they were with men that uh, taught them how to sell drugs or, you know, stuff like that. 90, 95% I would say of the population. The majority of the women, domestic violence, over and over again, sexual abuse and just trauma from an early age. You know, I used to sit in the groups there and I used to hear the women talk about their stories about their brother molested them and raped them and their father and their uncle. And I used to say, you know what, thank God I had a good brother. You know, just hearing the stories. I used to be like, oh my God, it's sure. traumatic. I was lucky enough to be part of one circle, one kind of listening and, and, and talking circle mm -hmm. that Novo com convened around the building. And one of the questions we were prodded <clears throat> with was, you know, if we were to imagine this building 100 years from now and it would be, mm. uh, have been a women's building for 100 years mm. and we had created a world without incarceration, mm -hmm. what mm. steps would we have taken and what role would this building have played to get us there or some version of that? I'm assuming you've done exercises like that. Can you mm. imagine I a world imagine. without incarceration and how we get to it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what role does a building play? Okay. I think, like Pamela knows that um, I'm really stuck on women being punished for prostitution. I'm really against that because the woman that's prostituting is probably trying to find an income. That's number one. Maybe trying to feed her children. And we, you know, we punish her again as a society like so i would imagine she could come to the women's building and get some skills get some education and you know try to empower her so that's what i envision the women's building empowering women to 
get some skills. Um, you know, learn how to open up a bank account or invest your money. And so what's your vision? What, what do you see happening in those, in those halls and, and, and building rooms? Mm. Will there be rooms? What's it going to look like? Mm. I don't know exactly what the women's building is going to look like in 100 years, but I know that in 100 years people are going to look at the prison cell that is going to be saved and memorialized as part of the building and say, I can't believe that they used to lock people up like that. And I can't believe they used to lock people up who'd been victims of violence, who were poor, who were single mothers, who you know, had everything stacked against them and were you know, resisting with all their might to survive. And that we actually locked those people up. That will be um, shocking to the people who go and visit that building. I know that for sure. And the activities that you do know about that, we, that you think will be happening in there are like what? Yeah. Well, after the consultation process that we embarked upon, um, we learned a lot, of, a lot about what the needs were for the community. And so we know that some of the things that are going to happen in that building for sure will be nonprofit office space, conference rooms, the event space, the ability to be able to connect with organizations that are working in different sectors. So economic justice groups can connect with violence against women groups. We'll be able to have impromptu political meetings at night. There's going to be on-site child care. There's going to be a wellness center, a meditative garden. It's an amazing vision, mm. and I'm confident you're going to realize it. Mm. There are some tricky spots along the way, and one yeah. of those is about private property. Mm -hmm. What will be the status of the property? How will it be operated, and how will you mm. shift power around mm. property ownership? Um, how will you model mm -hmm. doing that? Because mm -hmm. I know you will. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the um, the property is actually being leased. So we have entered into a 99 year, a 50 year lease with an opportunity to renew for 49 years from the state. with the state of New York. In terms of the how the building will be run, you know, I think one of the things we're very committed to at every step of the way is that it's going to be values aligned and mission aligned from beginning to end. So we know, for example, that the construction of the building, we are working to increase the number of women in the trades who will be working on the project. We have a commitment of 35% women, which you know, we know in the trades there's 3% women in the trades right now, less than 3%. So 35% women will be working on this project and we're creating a pipeline of good jobs for women in you know, union jobs in the construction trades. We also know that how the building will be run, we're exploring different options now for what that's going to look like, but to make sure that it's um, going to be sustainable and that it is going to be aligned with the values of a new economy that we want to promote, an economy that is not premised on racism and sexism, that is actually about community, that is about um, community accountability. And so we're thinking through all of those with the advisory circle and with this amazing group of activists that are helping to imagine this space together. Will trans women be welcome at the women's building? Of course. Of exactly. Course. Yeah. Yeah. Trans, gay, bisexual, whoever you are. <laughs> come. <laughs> exactly. We may even have a few men, right? Exactly. <laughs> no, we'll we talk are, about I, that. All, we, I think yeah. We, I, yeah, we talked about if we don't teach the men and the boys then you know mm -hmm. what's the what's the use? We need to teach them too how how we want this to happen. So finally, I mean, there's so much of what you've been going through that is relevant to our project of kind of remaking mm -hmm. so yeah. many of our relations, our relations around property, our relations around power. People are coming to this project with yes. very distinct levels of power exactly. and property and the familiarity mm -hmm. with dealing with property totally. and development and any of this stuff. What have you learned about how decision making is helped or hurt by those relationships? I will, for me personally, one of the things I feel most um, moved by and proud of in this project is I think that the ways in which everyone who has touched this project and been involved with this project is really committed to doing things differently and doing things in a more transparent and consensus building way and that we do have difficult conversations. This there is limited amount of space. You know, you asked what some of the biggest challenges are. The challenges are that it's we need way more buildings like this. I mean this is actually the you know this this neighborhood is full of luxury condos. So there is, are not activist spaces in this city. There are not affordable places for people to work and you know those kinds of things. So 
I think some of the biggest challenges around figuring out how to best use that space and to make sure that it's truly accessible for social justice activists, you know, now and 99 years from now. But I think the ways in which people have come to the table in ways that are truly grappling with hard issues, including space considerations, including notions of gender. You know, you asked if trans women are going to be welcome. Yes, of course trans women are going to be welcome. And we need to think about how is this building going to um, welcome everyone and what is gender going to mean 99 years from now? So mm -hmm. it's a women's building that welcomes everyone. And we feel like it's still important to name that women and girls, cis and trans, experience violence, oppression, be because we are women and girls. And that is really important to, mm. to name and to work from. What makes a place welcoming to you, Iris? And by you, I mean you in all of your aspects, including as a formerly incarcerated person. Well, what makes it welcoming? As soon as I come in the door, I should feel like I should be there. As soon as I come to the door, like when I came in this building, I felt like I belong here. So something like that, just a welcome, somebody to greet people when they come in. How are you? Come on in. What are you here for? What do you need? And yeah, welcoming atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Welcoming yeah. atmosphere, a good place to start, maybe a good place to finish. Thank you both. So you can Thank find out you. much more about this project, and we'd love to hear from you if you've ever been involved in a building project like this or comparable projects around the country. Let us know. Up next, an interview with Yoav Litvin, a scientist, photographer, and the author of the recently released book, To Create, with a number two. It's a book that's all about artistic collaborations and features the work of nine pairs of graffiti artists in New York City. Yoav Litvin, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you very much. You have a fabulous Jonathan Larson quote at the beginning of your new, completely gloriously beautiful book. Um, the opposite of war is not peace, it's creation. That obviously means a lot to you. Yes. I think um, our world is plagued with war. And what is war, if you really boil it down, it's destruction. And it's destruction of bonds between people, between families, groups, countries, right? And a lot of people idealize peace, let's just have peace. But that's not the end game. The end game for me is to create bonds. And art and creation is something that's really devalued in our kind of individualistic society. And I seek with this project to examine uh, with case studies of street artists and graffiti artists who work together how they create mm. the bonds and how different each one of these bonds are. I mean, that's really what To Create is all about. Uh, how did you start doing that work and why? So I started, uh, I became interested in street art and graffiti when I was still in my first career as a neuroscientist. And um, it's a long story, I got <laughs> injured and all I could do was walk. I couldn't really sit or lie down or stand without severe pain. And then I just started walking and reconnecting with New York City mm -hmm. on a very visceral level, walking 15, 20 miles a day. And I started documenting it, and I published a book called Outdoor Gallery, which looks at 46 different artists. And, but I noticed these collaborations, and they fascinated me. Like, this is more than just two people, one plus one. This is much greater than that. So this is where it began, where I looked at different pairs of artists, and then I was like, this is a book. This is a real project. And it is interesting because our stereotype, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, is that artists are all at each other's throats. Who's going to get the most attention? Who's going to get the most money? Who's going to get the most shows? Not true in the graffiti world? Or will it be true once the graffiti artists end up somewhere else? I think it's very interesting to look at dance and um, music, uh, which are inherently kind of collaborative arts. Mm -hmm. Whereas... Like um, journalism, if you don't mind me saying so. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and something like the visual arts, it has collaborative projects within it, but it's much easier to commodify. Right. So I think our culture, again, of this kind of profit-driven uh, culture has capitalized on this and has created an art market of visual art. And um, it's really kind of promoted this individualist approach of the artist who um, is, is kind of a sole genius. But in effect, when you read the history of artists like Picasso, like Van Gogh, 
they depended on other people. They collaborated mm. with other people as part of their trajectory. Give us some examples of the people you have in your book, just to give people a sense of what collaborations you're talking about. So I have Jilly Ballistic and Al Diaz as the first chapter in the book, and this is two generations of artists. Jilly is um, kind of a, the younger one, and Al Diaz is a very well-known uh, pioneer of graffiti. He started as Bomb One in the Lower East Side. He knew everybody there was to know. Uh, he was a partner with Jean-Michel Basquiat in Samo, which was a very uh, famous kind of project. And um, just to elaborate what that was, that was everybody using the same sort of moniker. Correct. Same old. Correct. And something about graffiti, kind of a tangent on this, is that there are graffiti crews. And graffiti crews serve a purpose. First of all, within graffiti, you want your moniker, your name out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So if you have five people writing the same name or one person, five people will cover more territory, right? Then also because it's illegal, you have people actually looking out for you, mm -hmm. okay? So one's on this corner, another's on that corner. Hey, police is coming, and, and, and you can escape. So there's, and that really demonstrates kind of the importance of collaboration, which is support. And the other thing that, well, one of the things that I read about in your book about Jilly Ballistic, this idea of claiming neighborhoods. So support one another, but also support an entire neighborhood as a place of, of, of community ownership at a time when that's being commodified too. Exactly, and it's, for me it's very interesting street art within an urban metropolis like New York City is, is like flowers. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like an, uh, something organic, something alive that's really coming out of the concrete and showing personality, claiming these neighborhoods that are going through this process of gentrification and commodification as something that belongs to a community. Finally, I guess I'm curious about a couple of things. One is gender in all of this. It seems as if the stereotype of women in most work environments is that we're more collaborative, we work more together, but it's also true that we don't tend to get the big dollar and the big ticket um, price on our work, uh, and we maybe haven't had a chance to do the so you know occupy that solo star place in the art world um, that the men have occupied. So how do you see women navigating um, the good and the bad of that situation. And then finally, a question of like, what does all this have to teach about capitalism as we're living it outside of the world of art and culture? So as far as um, gender, I, I highly recommend a book called Creative Collaborations uh, by Vera John Steiner, who writes about this very beautifully. And she looks at a book that's called Women's Ways of Knowing by a collaborative um, four women who wrote it in collaboration. So I'm, I'm, that's why I'm personally very interested in it. And they talk about how it's a cultural, the, the differences between men and women where we tend to think that women are more collaborative and men are less so. It's more of how, how our culture is constructed and not necessarily like anything biological. Or Of course it has nature and nurture built into it, but that plays off of the culture. Uh, as far as graffiti, it did start out as something very kind of macho, and there was violence involved and getting up and, you know, uh, you dissed me and I'm going to get back at you. And there was a lot of things um, that were very male-oriented, and there were fewer women involved historically. But nowadays, there are so many women who are doing fabulous work, top, you know, they're, they're succeeding just as well as men are, graffiti, street art. Uh, so that's definitely changed, and I think that's a great example of showing how the culture mm -hmm. affects it, and not necessarily it's some kind of biological or um, inherent thing. N nurture, not nature. Right. It's not even just those two. It's really kind of a plethora of of, of And then the, the, the teaching aspect. I mean, one of the things we've heard from people who try to make cooperative businesses is mm. how hard it is in our culture to have the skills, to acquire the skills, to collaborate, even to make decisions together. Right. Um, we can just about handle voting, right. um, but anything more collaborative than that, pretty hard, people tell us. Uh, are there lessons here that can be more broadly applied, how to actually make something together with other people? Yes, totally. I mean, the book is called To Create for a Reason, for two reasons. One is actually looking at the process of creation. And there you can really learn how these different pairs work differently. You know, um, There's five stages of every collaboration. Um, the first one is connection. The second one is fusion. The third one is transformation, if you're lucky. The fourth one is conflict. 
And that's really important too. People shy away from conflict in our culture. People are like, oh, conflict. But no, conflict is really important for progress because that's where you need to be confident, you need to be mature, you need to have a flexible ego to be able to handle critique and then change and evolve. So you have conflict and then you have either resolution or a breakup. In our society of individualism, that's not encouraged collaboration. Why? Because capitalism wants the status quo to remain as it is. So thank you so much for the book. It gives us so many other types of versions of, of history and of the current. It's called To Create, and it has some incredible documentation of art collaborations in New York City. Yoav Litvin is the author and collaborator with the artists. We'll put more information on our website. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.